Hi everyone, salams. Uh, welcome to the last MFest event of the day, telling queer and trans Muslim stories. I'm Raheel Mohammed. I'm the founder and director of Maslaha, which is running MFest with our partners, the British Library. MFest is a multi-arts festival. It's a festival of Muslim knowledge and creativity. And we've brought together some amazing artists, thinkers, activists, organizations to celebrate the diverse collective power of Muslim communities. We're connecting to our roots and ancestral knowledge. And we're also imagining thriving futures as well. So I'm just gonna run through some housekeeping before we get to the event. Uh, please use the menu above to leave any feedback. It's always really helpful for future event planning. And you can also donate to the British Library there as well, if you wish. Social media links for our speakers are below the video in case you want to carry on the conversation on other platforms. And welcome to Sumeya, um, who's been doing an amazing job doing our BSL interpreting for all of the MFest events. So we're so excited about hosting this event. There's been so much love coming at this panel for on our social media, um, on, on uh, telling queer and trans Muslim st stories. And I'm like really pleased to introduce the chair for the event, who is Latifa. Latifa is Director of Education at Maslaha and a trustee at the Inclusive Mosque Initiative. This provides a space for worship for marginalized Muslims, including queer and trans Muslims. She has done a range of work at a grassroots academic and policy level around the intersection of gender, sexuality, race, and Islam. Latifa has a, an academic background in law and formerly worked as a journalist is, in Istanbul. Her poems and prose have been featured in a range of places, including The Good Journal, Poetry Birmingham Literary Journal and VS Poetry Podcast. And I hope you enjoy the event. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rahil, for that kind introduction. And hey, everybody, Salam alaikum. Um, and welcome to this discussion on telling queer and trans Muslim stories. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I am so excited that we have this space with these four amazing people to have this conversation. In curating this event, we wanted to create a space where we could bring together some of the incredible people doing this work to think about how we nourish, honour and hold the stories of queer and trans Muslims today and in the past. And to discuss how, in a world where all too often queer and trans Muslim stories and lives are erased, co-opted or tokenized, we can create space for queer and trans Muslim stories to be told on their own terms. So without further ado, I will introduce our four incredible panelists. <coughs> um, Fatma Asghar is a poet, filmmaker, educator and performer. Fatma is a writer and co-creator of the Emmy nominated web series Brown Girls. Their debut book of poems, If They Come For Us, was released via One World and Random House in August 2018 to much acclaim. And along with Safia El Hilo, Fatma is the editor of Halal If You Hear Me Anthology. Additionally, Fatma has directed music videos for recording artists like Jamila Woods and Jai Denna, and wrote and directed a short film, Got Game, which was released in May 2020. Faryal Velmi, ran a disability charity in Brixton, South London for a decade, and her stories are inspired by campaigns for social justice and the multicultural tapestry of city life. She wrote on series two and three of Channel 4 and The Forge's groundbreaking show, Ackley Bridge. Faryal is currently developing a number of TV and film projects with BBC Studios, Fable Pictures and Dog Rose Productions. This includes Take Me Home, a drama about the political, awakening of a young homeless mum. Blair Imani is a historian, activist and public speaker. Blair has written two historical books, Modern Herstory, Stories of Women and Non-Binary People Rewriting History and Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream. Blair centres women and girls, global black communities and the LGBT community in her work 
she takes education further on Patreon and provides publicly accessible weekly lessons on Instagram. Blair has appeared on Fox News and MSNBC, presented at colleges, universities and conferences around the world and delivered talks for organizations and brands, including TEDx and GLAAD. And Zane Jukadar is the author of the novels The 30 Names of Night, which won the 2021 Stonewall Book Award and was a Lambda literary finalist in transgender fiction. And The Map of Salt and Stars, which was translated into 20 languages and won the 2018 Middle East Book Award. He recently guest edited the Queer and Trans Voices issue of Misna. His work has appeared in the Kink Anthology, Salon, the Paris Review and elsewhere, and has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and the Best of the Net. He is a member of the Radius of Arab American Writers and a Perry Plus Collective Mentor. So welcome to all of you. Um, and thank you so much for joining us and for making time for this. It really feels like such a blessing to have this space with you all. Um, so I'm just going to dive straight in to make the most of this hour that we have. And I wanted to, to first ask a question around creative medium and the creative mediums that you all work with. And um, so if I start with Fatma, um, you work across a wide range of artistic practice, poetry, photography, web series. And you've talked about the uniting factor in that hybrid work as being relationships. And in fact, you've said that your artistic medium is relationships, which I find fascinating. Um, can you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on this panel to so hear from everyone. Um, but to me, um, I... I think that it's so interesting when people talk about genre um, because I don't really see it. Like I, it's just something where I'm like, I'm here to tell certain stories and want to tell certain stories and they come how they come, right? So sometimes there's a story and I'm like, well, I really think that this needs to be done through photography or this needs to be done through this way. And then I'm like, well, I guess I got to learn how to do it. Like <laughs> I got to learn how to do photography or collaborate with someone, you know, like this is a film. I guess I got to learn how to do that. Like it, it's very much that for me. And it's a lot less um, like, oh, I am, I, this is my expertise in part because I don't really believe in expertise. But um, to me, the idea of art coming from relationships is really, really important to me because I think of um, relationships as being the fundamental thing that makes us human and the fundamental thing that makes us um, or just such an important part of existence and um, such an important part of like what it means to be alive on this earth in the worlds that we work in. For me, interdependent community is the most important thing that we can build towards and have and creating really strong interdependent communities and um, honoring relationship, honoring what it means to be in relationship. And so um, I was um, listening to a friend and a mentor of mine whose name is Krista Franklin, who um, is a really amazing um, multi-genre artist, um, works in poetry, works in um, literal collage, collage making, makes her own paper. Um, and she was talking, a question somebody posed at her was like, well, how do you go about getting the collaborations that you want? And she was like, you're thinking about collaboration wrong. Like she was talking about the idea of collaboration as relationship building. And I think about that, you know, is like, when we are collaborating with each other, we're really sh truly showing up in our divine purpose with our divine gifts as a collaborative source form material. That is what art making is. And so when you work in forms of art that are so highly collaborative, such as film, right, where you have all, you can't make film by yourself. There's so many people who come to film at the table. There needs to be a certain level of relationship building that's happening because you're not just, it's not transactional or for me, it's not, you know, it's really about how you create relationships, communities on uh, um, around art that feel safe, that feel like people can come through, work towards a joint vision and learn from each other in this way. Um, and so to me, you know, when I think about what, what my medium is and about relationships, all of my projects really center along the idea of some kind of thing in relationship, right? Sometimes it's 
wanting to break a silence on something. So there's been moments about like um, where I've, I've done things around like photography and, and um, naked photography and talking about people's bodies, their own relationship with their bodies, wanting to break a silence around that, right? Sometimes it's things like Brown Girls where it's like a film set and it's that, but it's also honoring the relationships that kind of led me to create that project, even though it's fiction, but it's based on relationships that I've had or ideas or kind of the texture of relationships that I've had. Um, so just thinking about how our art and how my art in particular really kind of is about my relationship to myself, my relationship to the world and my relationship to others and how it, it's an honorific process of that. Thank you so much for that, Fatma. And, um, and if I then move on to Blair, and Blair, please feel free, and all the speakers, please feel free to kind of speak to the responses that we're hearing and speak to each other in this as well. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the creative process in your work and activism, um, how and why you use the, the language imagery and mediums in the work that you do, and how that serves the communities that you work with and to support? Um, and also I wondered what possibility social media contributes to that as well. Thank you so much again uh, for having me as well. And as Fatima was speaking, it reminded me of one of the first times I was, I think the first time, only time I was featured in an anthology, Hello, if you hear me. And when you reached out, it was that relationship building, like it didn't feel out of the blue, like, can we get this thing from you? Um, but the thing is, since then, there's been such a transformation in how I express myself because I, I think with connecting to relationships and honoring ourselves and our interconnectedness is something that I've been on a journey on as well. I think especially throughout this pandemic of realizing that like we truly are not an island, like we are so interconnected fundamentally from the breath we breathe, from the, you know, personhood that we embody to the fact that when you have a small chat with someone, um, it's not just, you know, a passing thing. It's really being a part of their life, even in a minuscule way, you just never know how it can affect someone. Um, and so when the anthology came out, I was really treating th this public realm as my venting space. And I learned very quickly that it's not safe for that, particularly when you embody marginalized identities. Because on the one hand, you'll be fetishized, you'll be uplifted, and, and that's not the same thing as being honored, that's being tokenized. And I hadn't yet become or learned that, you know, I was naive at the time. I grew up in Los Angeles where visibility is tantamount to success and we don't learn the other side of it except for in very limited instances of seeing, you know, celebrity children go through that experience of, you know, having traumatic adulthoods or getting into that place. And so I wasn't applying that to me. And so I've completely transformed how I do my work and I feel like it's so much more intentional and it was really tied into my sobriety, um, getting to understand that I have alcohol use disorder, getting to understand that I was running away from aspects of myself even while declaring myself publicly externally. Um, and so for me, art is very spiritual as Fatima said. It is sharing parts of ourselves externally, whether or not we name them in the ways that uh, make sense to others or we don't name them at all. When we share parts of ourselves, it's like a sermon and somebody might take an aspect of it and apply it to themselves in ways that you can't even imagine. Um, I learned that very concretely when I had written a blog post about the show, um, The Bold Type. And there was a character who was a, you know, out Muslim lesbian and as a out bisexual Muslim, I was like, you know, I wanna write about this. This is really interesting to see and to see how this can be educational, but also tokenizing and interesting. And the next thing I know, like a couple months later, someone had sent me a picture of their forearm and they had tattooed one of the quotes from there. And I think that really made it concrete for me that I can't do anything half. I can't do anything without intention because I do not know how it will affect other people and you know, hopefully inspire other people, but that's something very grave um, and, and important to have an understanding of the material impact of, because you can be very seduced by things like visibility. And that's where I think social media comes in. On the one hand, it's like, oh, how amazing, I'm being seen, I'm being heard, I'm getting these likes. But what does that actually translate to in material fact? And so after I came out, I realized that people were looking at me, not just as an individual person, which is also what happens often, but also kind of like, a source of education and being able to say things like I don't have all the answers is the big, biggest blessing that I've been able to achieve for myself and that I wish for everyone uh, and I started working with Muslims for progressive values um, because I don't have the you know theological interpretation I mean I do now but at the time it felt so daunting and so to be able to like relay people to resources that they can actually access and use um, is something that I try to do and that's how I view my art and how I view the work that I do 
hiring people, investing in people, not just transactionally, like Fatima was saying, but really relationally. Um, and if that means taking home less money, it's worth it because you're able to invest in someone more. And I've been practicing uh, what my dad has taught me about um, Ujamaa, which is Africana socialism, cooperative economics, and the idea of, you know, kind of simply, like, if I'm eating, we're all eating, because one, who wants to eat alone? And two, why would you go alone, particularly when we are already made so vulnerable? And so um, I've been trying to adapt those things. And most recently, I've been learning that sometimes Allah is the best planner. I mean, all times Allah is the best planner, alhamdulillah. But it's learning about our own limitations and how do we fortify those limitations, but also step into them and realize, hey, I'm not going to be able to do this. I can do something else. Um, and so recently I've been learning that I talk very quickly. I can get on camera and do a little song and dance and I can capture people's attention. How do I utilize that and harness that with intention? And so uh, recently, for example, I did a lesson on the Tulsa massacre, uh, which was in uh, May 31st. 1921 and 300 black people were killed, 10,000 were left unhoused and the United States government did nothing. Um, and then turned around and asked black people to fight in a war, uh, people who were children during that time to go fight in a war for American independence, uh, again, for, you know, for freedom, for democracy in World War II. And so to see this duplicity, I try to expose that and try to do it in a way where people don't shudder from it, but instead embrace it and embrace this nuance and embrace the complexity and then apply that not only to historical events, but to themselves and to others and honor the kaleidoscopic nature of who we are as people and not trying to silo people into boxes. Thank you so much, Blair. Um, and now if we move on to Fariel, and again, Fariel, please feel free to speak to anything that's come up as well. Sure. Um, you're a screenwriter, um, what possibilities does screenwriting hold for the stories that you want to tell? Um, you're one of the writers who's written the, the brilliant character Nasreen Paracha in the UK series Ackley Bridge. Um, Nasreen is Muslim and lesbian. How did it feel to contribute to bringing that character alive on TV in, in the UK? Yeah. Cool, thanks for the questions. Um, I suppose the first thing about the possibility, what does it, you know, being a screenwriter, what does it hold for me? Well, so the first thing to say is that, you know, getting a script to screen is uh, quite an arduous task. Um, so those who manage to do it, uh, it's, yeah, it's it's great. Um, and you have to, you have to work, you have to have luck, but obviously, you know, after, I suppose in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, it's been a huge movement to people talking about representation, you know, in the wake of that, amazing movement um you've got um the black film collective in the states and you've got lots of um uh you know black and brown um writers and producing directors really addressing the massive dearth of representation that we have as people of color um you know on screen and i would say that political struggle actually creates space in front of the camera and behind the camera so the fact that we can have an opportunity to take up space and make space for queer characters is is really amazing when it does happen, um, because obviously you know TV and film are immensely powerful mediums, um, and so yeah, it's been really amazing to be able to write for um, that show. So before I wrote for it, I was actually a, you know a fan of it. So I was like on you know it's like prime time British TV on like you know just Channel Four watching it. So let's see this like you know. Um, British young teenager Pakistani kind of come out to her mom and it was like what is this show this is just amazing um, and then to be given an opportunity to write for that character as well was like a real kind of privilege uh, but then also there's also a pressure about getting getting it right whatever that means um, and I think that now the real challenge is like really making sure that representations have nuance that there is you know intersectionality is addressed because that's the reality of our lives and you know, um, we are seeing shows which are kind of breaking the mould. We've got um, Lady Parts by Nidal Manzur, um, which has come out on Channel 4, which is a, a real varied representation of British Muslim women, which I really enjoyed. And yeah, we need to see, we need to see more of that. But then also um, to, you know, resist that pigeonhole too as well. Like, you know, there was a time quite after actually, I literally got sent every single like brown queer girl, like, you know, storyline or film, whatever. I was just like, okay, I, I really like that, but also I want to write other stories and I want to be able to, you know, 
do that um you know and that's also really important um but yeah it's really it's crucial to take up space and make space and i look forward to doing more of that in my work for sure thank you so much faria um and zane you work across a wide range of writing forms so short stories poetry essays and your two novels the map of salt and stars and the award-winning 30 Names of Night. Um, and I wondered what possibilities you feel that fiction and young adult fiction has as a space for telling queer and trans Muslim stories and also for allowing queer and trans Muslim characters and lives a, a space to breathe. Um, and I wondered how did you come to fiction as a way to tell those stories? Um, and also congratulations on the Stonewall Book Award. And how did, how did that feel for you? Because it's so recent. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the Stonewall was a big surprise. And then um, last night, too, um, I don't know, some folks are watching. Um, well, now when this airs, it won't be last night, of course. But <laughs> um, but um, this past week, uh, I, I found out that I won um, the, the Lambda as well for trans fiction, which was also like, uh, for me, it was like a big shock. Um, and I was honestly so just an honor to be nominated alongside so many amazing writers. And I think, you know, uh, when I think about working in fiction as a form, um, long form fiction especially, I mean, I am really excited about the possibilities that are coming out now that I'm seeing folks um, doing now in terms of um, what's possible for the novel as well as what's possible for other long form projects. Um, I personally, I think that the reason I was drawn to fiction to begin with um, when I was much, much younger than as a kid was just that you know, the stories that we tell ourselves have a big effect on what we're able to imagine for ourselves. Um, and, you know, I think that there is, as other folks have mentioned, um, and something I think a lot about too, there's sort of a trap, I think, when it comes to like representation and visibility, um, being uh, sort of, we can fall into the trap of thinking that that's like an end in and of itself, when in reality, um, we're, it, it doesn't necessarily solve anything. And there is such a, a risk that we usually run of, of being tokenized and then not actually um, being given, you know, any kind of progress in what we need materially to survive. Um, but that said, I do think that like, when I come to the page, for me, the novel especially um, is a way for me to um, have a conversation with myself um, and not just with myself, but increasingly the more that I write and the more that I, uh, the more, um, the more, I guess, deeply, um, and I wanna say like embedded, but it's more like uh, rooted in community that I find myself. Um, the more it becomes a conversation that I'm also having with other folks, um, that, that I'm trying to answer some question that I have for myself that um, I'm talking about already with other people and that the novel as a form is a way for me to like answer that question and find out what I think. And I, and I also think that, um, you know, a story can be a gift that you can give to a character that you want to give to yourself. This is a thing that I've found to be true in all of the, my novels that I've written, um, that I'm, I'm trying to, I want, there's a thing that I want for myself that I want to understand or I want to have and I want to sort of manifest in my life or I want to make connections with other people in a certain kind of way and be present in a certain kind of way. And I may be trying to figure out how to do that on the page and uh, by allowing a character to do that. Um, and I think that that's especially, it can be especially true in young adult fiction. I mean, so Map of Salt and Stars was a, was a crossover, young adult, adult crossover. It's how it was marketed anyway. I wrote it as an adult book, but it, it has a 12 year old protagonist. So it makes sense, I think, um, for it to be crossover. And then 30 Names was adult, but um, I am actually in the, in the process of, of writing another young adult project now. And I'm, you know, really aware that like the stories we tell ourselves have huge consequences for what we're able to imagine um, and build for ourselves. So it's, you know, I know that that can't be the end all be all. It, there, there has to be a point at which it makes its way out of our imaginations and into like material reality. Um, but it can hopefully be a start, you know, and that means a lot to me to be able to contribute to. Thank you so much, Zane. 
Um, and I've got the map of salt and stars here. I've actually got Blair and Fatima's books here too, but I, I forgot to kind of wave them around. I might just do that now quickly. Here we go. Um, but I just wanted to move on um, because a big focus for us at MFest is thinking, is reclaiming and recontextualizing um, the diverse stories that represent Muslim communities. Um, and I guess I wanted to think now about how this feels specifically important for queer and trans Muslim stories. So to start with Blair, um, this, so you've written two books and they're both historical. And in this book here, um, you, so it's in modern, modern history, stories of women and non-binary people rewriting history. You place a spotlight on 70 people, mostly people of color, and many of whom are queer, trans, disabled, and Muslim who are changing the world right now. Um, so I wondered what was the motivation for you in essentially writing those people into history? And can you talk a bit about why connecting with history feels so important in the work that you do? So that was like my first entry into writing, like formally. Um, and the way that it happened was so non-traditional, which makes sense because non-traditional authors don't usually get to writing in a traditional path because of white supremacy and patriarchy and all of these systems of oppression that try to keep us out. So when we get there, we get there by any means necessary. And so uh, for me, I had been doing this series. I had a nonprofit that I used to run called Equality for Her. It's now defunct, but it was basically trying to use the medium of infographics, which is so popular now to convey information. But I remember doing that in like 2013, 2014. It was like, what? How can you condense things into that small? Like that's not gonna take off on social media. And lo and behold, it has become a blight on social media now. <laughs> and so um, I basically started doing these features and I did it myself to start with in 2014. March, 2014, I did these little kind of you know, bathroom sign, like super minimalist illustrations of women who needed to be featured, who are erased. And I would sprinkle in people who you might be used to hearing about as well as folks who you might never hear about because I wanted to kind of tantalize people and get folks to participate. And then Tumblr, uh, the staff at Tumblr featured that as one of their top picks. And I was like, oh, maybe we're onto something. And so as I started to, you know, grow this team of volunteers, it started to expand. And um, I think by 2017, right after the Women's March and Donald Trump's election and people realizing once again, because it happens every three months, that oppression is very serious and we should take it very seriously, there was a heightened interest in this medium. And um, I hired Monique Lay and she's a Vietnamese educator. Um, she was literally in school to become a dentist. And I think she's still on that path right now. But I was like, hey, in between your finals, can you please do these illustrations? And so it just really worked out so swimmingly and we were compiling these people together and we wanted to feature a person every single day of the month of March. Because as we know, women's history and the whole idea of womanhood is so colonized. I mean, the very designation of woman in pre-colonial African societies, woman wasn't a recognized or existing form of social categorization. People did not categorize themselves across the world based on their genitals. And then a specific combination of genitals and chromosomal typing before birth to, this, to say that there's two of these things. And if you're this, you should make 100% of your money. And if you're this, you should make 70%. And if you're neither, then you don't exist. These things are so violent, so colonized. And so my, my understanding of gender wasn't quite that evolved yet. Um, and I want everyone to get there. And I talk about that more in my third book, which comes out in October. Um, it's called Read This to Get Smarter, even though we're all smart, it's just getting smarter. Um, and so I wanted to kind of disrupt that. And the way that I was using the language of disrupting that was intersectionality with Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. And so I wanted to front load the book with people of color, with trans folks, with, you know, folks who disrupt the cis hetero patriarchy in complex and interesting ways. And there's so many folks that should be included, like, you know, limiting things to 70 and defining things was a difficult process for me because I try to undefine and to add complexity, not to reduce. Cause we can make things simple without reducing things. Um, but then the reason why I got published was because LeVar Burton elevated it. And even when I was doing the publishing process, people were saying, well, I would love to see more white women in it. Why aren't there more of this in it? Why do you have Rihanna Fenty, Robin Rihanna Fenty in here? Why do you have like, and it was just so nonsensical to me because even though I had made it and gotten on to the table, I was still being gatekept. And that's why it's important to tell history and to interface with history and to decolonize history because 
the truth of the matter is that things like the, you know, Birmingham bus boycotts didn't just happen because Dr. King said, let's go. It happened because everyone sacrificed something. But unless we learn that collectivist approach to history, then we're going to think there's only a few ordained among us to save us instead of recognizing that we can save ourselves. And so I wanted to do that, just like Zane was saying, being able to see ourselves in stories. And I think everything that we, like we've also like kind of echoed, like if we can see ourselves, and I think I said it in the book that if we only listen to stories or have stories where white men are victors, then how can we all feel victorious? Because history is a tool and it can liberate, but it most often oppresses and that's intentional and we can disrupt that. Thank you so much, Blair. Um, and then moving on to Fatma. So a lot of your work considers the violence of divorcing people from their history. Um, and in When They Come For Us, you weave together the violent inheritances of partition and your personal inheritance of partition with themes of identity. So queerness, grief, religion. And I wondered what felt important to you about situating yourself and those elements of identity in that historical context. I really echo a lot of what Blair was saying about the, the, the importance of history and then also thinking about like how history very deeply lives in our bodies like and lives in the land right like in it's so deep the way that history scars and history you know like there are it's like you 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 hurt the land that way you hurt people that way there's there's a site of um fissure that happens and there is um, there are things from, you know, there, there are spirits, there are, there are wounds that then exist and are alive and live there, right? And I think um, it's really white, white, I was like, is it white? I think it's really white and Western to think that that doesn't happen, right? And so in our bodies, we have a lot of this stuff that we're carrying that we might not even understand or fully know or think about until we start to tap in and start to realize that some of this is ancestral, right? Um, for me, my parents died when I was really, really young. And so I am an orphan. I have the kind, I have a lot of that wounding of what does it mean to be really so unparented um, and grow up without that. And when I tap into some of that, there's also this thing around feeling like an exile and feeling exiled from something, feeling taken from a land that was once yours, right? And so I was like, where does this come from? Like, what is this? You know, and when I was doing a lot of this work, I was really young and I didn't know what, I didn't have the language for, it. you know, I didn't have the fancy language for it. But what I had was poetry as a way of kind of exploring and my own, you know, my own other things that I was doing as a way of exploring. And in that, I found um, my family's history of partition, right? So my family is also an older family. My parents were both alive before partition. And my mom's side of the family, who I know, I don't really know my dad's side. Um, were all in Kashmir, living in Kashmir before partition happened. And so then partition happened. And then specifically what I think when they talk about it, they're like, it's partition. But when I look at history, what they're saying, the memories of what my family is saying really sounds like the Dogra program, which happened immediately after partition, right? So we're looking at South Asia, we're looking at huge histories of violence that have happened there and that continue in the bodies and the movement patterns of these people as they are trying to find a space to be safe, as they're trying to find a space where they can make the work that, and do the work that they wanna do and where they can try and raise families, right? And so um, for me, that that was really important to think about. And it was really important to, to cause you know, when I was taught about, I feel like um, the colonization, what I was talking about in the United States about the colonization of South Asia was like, oh, the tea, they were looking for tea. And then they, you know, they came to America and also as they were looking for India, like it was very weird. And then they were like, and then Gandhi marched and everybody was free. Like it was nonviolent. It was completely a nonviolent movement and everybody was free, right? Partition is one of the most violent things that have happened in the, in the last century, like literally the most violent things. And it happened in the span of a few months and a few years. And what Britain did prior to partition in terms of colonization, in terms of stripping out resources, in terms of all of this is so vast. It's And it's horrific, right? And so for them, for people to have the narrative be, this was a nonviolent movement and we should all be looking at these people as nonviolent is, is completely bullshit because who was 
who was being harmed violently was other South Asian people, right? And so that's not considered even in the, in the category of violence because our bodies are not considered worth talking about in terms of violence, right? And so because they're sitting over there talking about, oh, no, British white people were hurt or very few British white people were hurt, they're considering this a nonviolent movement. That movement and the drawing of lines that happen have incredible effects to today. So if you're looking at South Asia today and we're, if we're looking at even just the example of like, you know, you, what you see is like the 1971 liberation war and subsequent genocide that Pakistan conducted in Bangladesh, right? That, that was a result of in part that drawing of that line, right? What you're also looking at is the um, genocide against Muslim people in India today. What you're looking at is the genocide against non-Muslim people in Pakistan today. And what you're looking at is the colonization of Kashmir by both Pakistan and India that's happening right now, right? All of this you can trace back to the year of 1947. You can trace back to different kinds of colonizations that have happened. And you can say that, th how can you possibly say that this is a nonviolent movement <laughs> when you have this thing still in our bodies happening right now, in our uh, happening on land right now and happening in diaspora right now, right? When you're also looking at things, you can't talk about South Asia without talking about partition. You can't talk about South Asia without talking about colonization. You can't talk about South Asia without talking about casteism. And without talking about our really complicated ideas of what it means to have different religions that have fed and interfed each other for so long that then become yoked out in a kind of um, in, in a kind of mass scale in a way that is extremely harmful. Right. And so to me. Um, I needed to write that, right? Like what I what I found really important was to write that. And then also to talk about myself who is situated in that history, who is situated in that lineage and who is also a person who is queer, right? And who is a person who is queer in many ways, right? Who's pansexual and then who's also often gender questioning in, in a kind of perpetual state of what the fuck is my gender and am I, am I ever gonna find it out? <laughs> and probably not, you know, but being on that life path of figuring out what does it mean to really do the slow listening of my body and my desire and allow that to kind of go, especially when it goes against the ideas of what we're taught is sexuality, is, is gender, is this thing, right? When it goes against the ideas of what we're taught is allegiance, then what does the nation become, right? When we're taught about what does it mean to build strong interdependent community, then what the fuck really is the nation state, right? And do we really need it? And I think that once we start to really go into actually what we authentic need, we look at our histories and what we learn from it, we can create new paths to solidarity building, we can create new paths to community formation, we can create new things about identity that we don't even fully know about and desire and putting names on that. And that to me is where I need to orient because I can't do this. I can't do that, that thing of this is what this means or these lies. And of course I can be informed by that and I have to be informed by that and I have to be informed by history but I can't ignore history the way that we're taught to ignore it, right? And even thinking about my people, like my family came to the U.S., I think, um, in many different iterations, but my parents, I think, came in the 80s, right? And um, but like, for example, the Tulsa um, massacre is important in my history because we live on occupied land in this current iteration of what America means in this country. And therefore, that even though that pre predated them, you know, coming here and predated me, it's part of the history that we intersect with when we come here and what we need to know about and how we need to know so that we can inform and move how we um, walk around this land, how we interact with it and how we interact with all of the people who are in it, right? And so sometimes like, oh, sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but thinking about what Blair is saying about tokenization, I think, um, was it Blair or maybe it was Zane? I can't remember. But when we're talking about tokenization, it's also this idea of, oh, well, this is South Asian history or this is Black history. And it's actually like, these things are actually the histories of all of us. And we actually need to really understand. Yes. Like we can't be out here being like, well, that history is not my history because it really is. And when we think about how interdependent our communities are, we really need to understand that. And we really need to show up with the humility to learn, the humility to listen to each other, the knowledge that we only know, even if we study these things, we'll only know like a microscope of some of this stuff and that we really need to do the work of 
of, of really learning and listening um, not only to each other, but to the land and to what's going on and what's going on around us and this so that we can really begin to think about how we can repair and how we can build better futures. I wanted to just chime in briefly because it's such like a solidarity and interconnecting point. When I learned about partition in the history of South Asia class I took at LSU when I was in college, I took it kind of like, I was like, oh, I need one more history class, but that's actually the reason I converted to Islam and really gave me such a richer understanding of black American history. And also to step into that humility of no, I cannot apply my understanding of American race relations. And then like, you know, overlay that but I can under place my understanding of decolonization, especially since it's zero colonial colonization. But understanding partition gave me such a richer understanding that I did come into that class thinking, oh, this is like segregation. But no, it is different and that is okay. But there are threads of similarities and there are threads of healings that have to be understood because we have to look at all of the ways that colonization has harmed us in order to heal all of the ways it has harmed us. Because if we're just looking at it you know, in this linear way or ignoring history, like you were just saying, Fatima, then we'll never get free because we don't even know what we're up against. Thank you, Blair, and thank you, Fatima. Um, and continuing then with those themes, Zain, I wanted to ask you, um, history and moving across time play such a central role in both of your books. Um, in A Map of Salt and Stars, you've, the, the book follows the journey of two characters as they travel along identical paths 800 years apart. And um, so I wondered for you, what's the importance of connecting with history in your, in your novels and in your work? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I could also just underscore every single thing that Fatima and Blair said. Um, gosh, I just feel privileged to like have been privy to that, that exchange. Um, you're both brilliant. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, when I, when I think about why I write so much historical, let's say historical thread, um, like historical threads that go through the, the, the stories that I tell in my novels or, um, cause it's hard to classify them, I think as historical novels. I think they are often classified that way because there are significant historical pieces. But um, I do often do this thing where I either weave in and out of time or I try to show how the present day is related to something that happened before. Um, and I, th I think the reason that I do that is because one, I think it's not just important, I think it's indispensable for us to know our history in order to imagine the future um, for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, because it, I think that when, one of the, the ways that oppression often works um, is to sort of steal our histories uh, from our communities where we're not allowed to engage with history in on our own terms. We're not allowed to, um, to, to actually tell the stories of what happened to our own ancestors yeah, accurately um, because power uh, in the way that it, it relates history is never neutral. Um, one of the, the themes that was um, central to the map of salt and stars was, was uh, kind of taking this concept and talking about it through maps and the way that maps and map making um, are also never neutral. Um, that, that maps are usually made by the people with the power to, to sort of um, organize and label the world in the way that is most convenient and useful for them. Um, so as an example, like in the map of salt and stars in the, in the original hardcover, and I think in the paperback too, you open it up and there's a map and south is at the top. And it's, um, it's sort of an illustrator's interpretation of a map made by this map maker, Mohamed al Idrisi, that um, is a character in the book. Um, and part of the reason that that's there is just to sort of destabilize the reader's idea of what a map is and that a map is objective in any way, um, because that was at the time um, that this map maker lived um, in the 1100s. This was in that part of the world that was the convention for maps. And I wanted the reader to think about, you know, why might South be at the top and not North? Why would Europe not be at the top of the map? Well, maybe because power wasn't concentrated in Europe in that way um, in the Mediterranean in that time period. Um, and so, um, yeah, just thinking about the ways that that uh, history and and the, the map that we have of, of history often reflects, not often, almost always reflects power in some way. Um, and then also I think that like, <laughs> we also, I think this is something I think about a lot um, that our, uh, our ancestors and our elders survived a lot and that we often um, 
it is extremely true what Fatima was saying that trauma and, um, and violence lives on in our bodies and in the body of the land. And this is something also that in the 30 Names of Night um, gets sort of made visible by talking about how, um, you know, even like for those of us who are um, not indigenous to Turtle Island, that like the ways in which that land, um, the history of that, that occupied land that we live on, um, is it exists all around us and is visible if we look for it and is important for us to understand. Um, that gets made visible by birds sort of in not birds sort of like flocking to New York City um, in sort of this fabulous way, you might say, um, that sort of mimics like the way white blood cells might flock to a wound to try to, to heal it um, or at least to like make it visible. Um, and, you know, but there's also, I think, a way in which like Res, like resistance and resilience and, and survival also get passed down to us in our bodies by our, our ancestors, but also that we can access those, um, those things by talking to our elders. And also I think by um, interacting with history, being aware of the history of, of our communities, our families. Um, and, and I think that like, if we don't have access to that, like we get deprived of that knowledge too, right? Of how people survived um, and not just in like a logistical way, but just of the fact that they did survive for us to be here today. And that that's a thing that like, that's a thing that we can celebrate. And that's also, and, I, and I've been thinking about this a lot um, recently uh, and, and more and more, I think as we move into Pride Month that I, I always reflect on this this time of year, maybe just that um, there's also a lot of pain that like can't be ever fully held, I think, um, and that maybe just needs to be acknowledged and, you know, that we can reflect on all the things that our ancestors and our elders survived for us to be here. And that it's important that we just engage with that because it doesn't go away. It just because we are in a different time or place, um, that it's always present for us and always affecting the present moment. And so that's, I think why a lot of my stories have these multiple timelines or talk about the ways in which history is present to us now, because even if I make that visible in like a fabulous way um, with, with birds or with, with stories and with maps and whatever way I do it, it's not meant to be figurative at all. It's very literal. It's very present for us. Um, and I think that we just, we have to be aware of that in order to try to, 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 build anything, if we want anything to be different, we have to do it with that knowledge intact, I think. Thank you so much, Zain. Um, and Fariel, and I'm so conscious of time, I really wish we had more time together. But Fariel, I wondered it, it, from all of that, um, if you have any comments, but also I had a question I wanted to ask everyone, which was, you know, Zain mentioned ancestors and um, a question, I suppose, of how do we honor our queer and trans ancestors? Um, and their lives and stories when many of those maybe have been erased or co-opted and so on. Um, so yeah, I'll pass that to you, Fariel. And then if yeah, and jump in. Thank, I mean, yeah, such amazing contributions. I can't wait to listen to them again, they're amazing. Um, absolutely, you know, look, the decolonization of history as it's taught in schools, it's just such a mammoth, gigantic task to unpick. Um, you know, we are, Absolutely, you know, in Britain, we learn all about kings and queens and how many wives Henry VIII had. We never learn about the Grunwick strike, which was like amazing South Asian women who like, you know, on factory and like really changed the British labor movement. We learn about, you know, dupes and duchesses. We don't learn about William Coffey, who was one of the leaders of uh, a black man in Victorian Britain who led like political working class, you know, um, movement, which was one of the biggest ever this country so absolutely like there's there's a there's a history um a radical history not even that radical actually which is part of working five lives of people that just are never taught i mean i think the other thing to say is talking about queer ancestors you know the pull of the cis heteropatriarchy i think play you talked about it is so strong i, I have an 11 year old and you know we're raised, you know we're raised with my partner his father was a gay guy we have this family around us but to think that he would just through a process of osmosis like you know just pick up this idea of what we're talking about of challenging gender and you know celebrating difference in terms of queer identities you know it's a constant 
provide you have to constantly provide him with a counter narrative about that because you know what you learn in school what you learn online is just so absolutely it's it's the pull of that is so strong and so I think you know saying books you know authors like yourself writing for young people or just you know that type of education is just so crucial um and I feel really yeah really it's it, you know even going to pride events and taking him to pride events and be able to see what that means um unfortunately the last couple of london prides it means a parade of corporations rather than actual community groups i think that's the story of the whole prides over but just to have um, a space where you know you can you know celebrate queerness in in everything that that means is really important um so yeah that's on my, my contribution really but I feel that someone talked about having futures at the beginning of, of this discussion. And I think that having, you know, resources available to, to young people um, and being able to, you know, not it's not just being kind of a tokenistic month where we talk, you know, supposedly. I mean, I don't even think a lot of British schools, even if that month, an LGBTQ history month, even have syllabuses that, you know, we're so far away, actually, from ingraining into everyday education, um, whether it's talking about like, you know, proper colonial histories well you know you guys talked about or even radical working class history or queer histories into our day curriculum it seems like a long way away so we have to provide that ourselves um so yeah and and, and we must and like it's fantastic to have people like yourselves who are kind of putting out things you know blair all your work that you do you know on social media and fact now your, your your poetry and zane your books like we need we need queer creatives who are out there pushing out you know it's it's just so important so yeah all power to you guys thank you Faryal, and all power to you too in your work um and I wonder, does anyone else have any anything that you'd want to share to that question of ancestors and connecting with queer and trans ancestors, if and how you do that? I'd like to add briefly, I think a massive part of it is to find them on their terms and not on ours, because I think of people like Lorraine Hansberry, who isn't understood ever as bisexual, but is always understood as a lesbian who married a man because bisexuals don't exist, but we're out here. Pansexuals exist, omnisexuals exist. People exist in their understanding and they don't have to have a label ascribed to it in order for them to be valid and real. Um, I also think about people like Georgia Black, whose story I came across as I was going through the archives of Ebony Magazine. And the idea I think was to go and do this inflammatory story about a doctor who had outed this black trans woman as trans, not in, those lang not in that language of course, but um, in at least the understanding. And the interviewer kept trying to find somebody to say something horrible to shock readers and to sell magazines. And everyone they came across, even the white folks in the segregated city in 1951 in Florida, sorry, I'm talking so fast. Even in the segregated city in 1951 in Florida, the church accepted her, the white people <laughs> accepted her, her family accepted her, her children accepted her because it's not novel to accept people. It's actually rather novel to exclude and harm people and to say that difference is bad instead of difference is human and that it is inherently worthy of respect and good. And so I think that when we look at things and we say, ah, oh, the first person to do Y, the first person to do X, we must take a step back and say, in European history, in Euro colonial history, and really add that disclaimer and stop considering that these things are new, but they're ancient, they're older than us. Um, and just to Zane's point, honoring our ancestors is necessary to honor the future. And that's why I love sci-fi so much because it is so colonized. Why does everybody in the future have a British accent? Because Euro colonialism wants to exist in the future. And so we have to disrupt that. And so it's not just history, but the future defining what humanity will evolve to and look like. and um, just honoring that complexity and honoring the complexity of our ancestors because we are not the smarter ones because we're newer. We are not necessarily their wildest dreams. It's okay if they never thought about us, but we need to honor them and think about them and honor the fact that they existed for us to exist um, and do that in ways that speak to their reality and also honoring our ancestors before they become ancestors by engaging with elders and not... Um, colonizing the ways that elders express themselves with this changing of language or excluding people because they aren't saying the words that we say. So just honoring people on their terms, past and present and future. 
I love that. And I, I think that just thinking about um, just that there's probably so many queer ancestors in our own blood lineages that we don't know. And, and that maybe we wouldn't even legibly understand as queer, but are. And so thinking about just like, as Blair was saying, like the energetic of queerness and for us to make sure that that doesn't get co-opted as like the energetic of heterosexuality with just like queer people in the replacement of that. And that like the gift of queerness is what it allows for the freedoms of possibility of relating to, of being related to, and of being on our own terms with that, right? And so like, what does it mean to resist leg legibility? You know, what does it mean to, to kind of resist some of this stuff and to know that like that exists in our family lines? Like even if, even if no one in our family lines will talk about it to us, like it exists, you know, and we might not know that, but like, like they're with us and just to give a little bit of that knowledge and that presence. And so for so long, I think I operated in, oh, I feel so alone. I feel so alone. Why am I so, and the resentment of loneliness, the resentment and the seduction of loneliness, the seduction of also of like, what does it mean if you think you're the first of your family to do something and you're like, I'm the first, you know, and then being like, no, buck that you're probably not. And like, just what does it really mean to be like, actually I am held and I'm held by people I might not know, but will inshallah make themselves known to me as I need them and as they need me. Right. And so I think just like really, really existing in that terrain of because I think sometimes something I see in queer communities is like an, an over policing of what does it mean to be queer and what qualifies queerness. And it's like, yo, y'all, we need, we can't be doing that. Like, you know what I mean? We just, that is a violence on ourselves and it's, it's not productive and just being able to like really, and like, yes, there's conversations about like who's most at risk and like, you know, co-opting of that. And of course, and of, of like, you know, really wanting to honor that, but just thinking about like, what does it really mean to allow for queerness to exist in so many forms, even when they're not legible to yourself, like even when you yourself can't understand that. And just the freedom of that and encouraging us all as queer people to really, or people, those of us who identify as queer, as to really kind of like honor that energetic and to not try to just co-op that as like a heterosexual energetic with queer representation that's there. Oh, thank you so much yeah. all of you. Um, we've just got, we've got just over five minutes left. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, so this week we saw the Florida governor signing a bill banning trans women and girls from taking part in women's sports at school. Um, and I just wanted to ask, you know, to, to any of you an open question, in this time of toxic transphobia in the US, in the UK and elsewhere, what do you think should be happening in LGBT Muslim communities and circles to better support trans Muslim lives, leadership, rights and representation, and whether creativity and storytelling can play a part in that? I'm happy to start uh, for going around. I mean, I... <laughs> You know, I think we touched on this earlier. I think multiple people touched on this, but just that like representation and visibility doesn't necessarily equal better material conditions for our survival. It doesn't equal our liberation. Um, and, you know, that often what it means is just power taking people that are more palatable to its ends and giving them positive visibility and rewarding them. And then people that are less palatable to power or refuse or make themselves difficult to be co-opted to power's ends and taking them and making them targets. And I think that that is really the case. Um, I think we're seeing that a lot for trans women, especially black trans women and trans girls. And that's, I mean, we're seeing this wave of legislation because they're easy targets that are um, being made into, you know, a symbol to, to rally around a conservative, to rally a conservative base around. Um, it's, you know, it doesn't, how do I say, I, I just think that it's important for us to like not get um, distracted when we're talking about these things um, and to keep our eyes on the fact that like, there are concrete things that will help all of us like abolishing the police and, um, and fighting against the, the binds that capitalism puts us in, in terms of how we, how we get to show up in the world and, and deal with so many things. Um, and, and, um, and ending, you know, um, like prisons and, the, you know, how many of um, our like most 
vulnerable and, and also mo most visible members like do face increased incarceration. Um, and, and anyway, I mean, we can go on and on about specific material conditions, but that like, those are the things that we have to be focusing on um, like above and beyond just visibility and representation. Um, even though that's something that like when we're talking about you know, um, like us as creatives and, and, you know, writers and artists and things like that may be where we're like starting from um, in terms of what we're like, what we're doing day to day, but that like, it can't be the only thing that we're doing and focusing on. Um, yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? I think also just like in terms, cause you're like, I really echo everything Zane is saying. And then w when you were talking about like m Muslim communities in specific, and I think it's like, we need to make people safe. Like we need to create the mechanisms that make people safe, right? And so what that means is like, in some ways is like, sent we need to center like trans Muslim people in queer uh, Muslim spaces. Like, it, it's just like, we need to hold people. We need to understand, like we need to ask people what their needs are, how we can meet them and how we can make them feel safe, right? And so if that means like, you know, after the meeting, you drive someone home or you you pay for someone's Uber or you try to help someone. Like, it's like literally small things like that too, but just like being like really trying to think about how can you make people safe? How can you create spaces where folks feel safe to just even exhale from all of the transphobia in the world? And then how do we like then show up for the fight for like, okay, how can we, how can we move against this? How can we kind of rally and go against this? But I think that just so many people need safety. We all do, you know, and for so many of us, safety feels elusive. And so what does it mean to really insist on spaces that are centered around safety first, you know, and are not centered around other things, but safety? I think I, I just want to say briefly too, I find so many people come to me because, um, you know, I'm like a public educator, I'm a out queer Muslim and like highly visible. And I'll have people come to me for justification why they should support someone instead of defaulting to supporting someone because it's the right thing to do, not because there's a surah telling you to do it. And I think that's harsh words, but it's necessary because Islam doesn't begin and end with the Quran, in my view. It is our actions, it is our bodies, it's the land, it's our interconnectedness. And we can't be inactive until we are told that it's okay. We must have a sense of moral compass and take that free will that we are given by Allah to be people of justice because Islam is an active participation in righting the wrongs of humanity and reducing harm. And I think that's what drew me to the religion. And so it frustrates me so much when I, people, when I see people saying, well, is this okay? Well, you know, it's not okay. And what we have abundant proof of in various surahs is that dehumanization and violence is wrong. So why don't we start there and maybe table the three colonized interpretations of the prophet lot that make you feel like you shouldn't support LGBTQ plus people and just be a good person because that's what Allah put us here to do. Um, I think those are like the terser words I would use, but I think that's necessary because when, it, where, when there is an action and there's just such clear violence to say nothing, even if you don't have the right things to say to direct people in the right direction is the appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Could, I, could I say one yeah. thing about um, safe spaces, um, which was like a really important point that Fatima made. Like we also have like obviously post pandemic, like a real fallout of the fact that, you know, especially in London, like we, where, where are our community spaces as LGBTQ people? Like, yes, you know, there are some, um, I know the Inclusive Mosque is, is an amazing resource, um, but in terms of funding, in terms of like, you know, trying to find a space that's perhaps not just about like alcohol or hookups. It's like, we you know, we're, we're, you know, we need funding for spaces. We need to fight for funding to have, create those safe spaces as well. I think that's really important. And, you know, there's, there's lots of, lots of work to be done, definitely standing in solidarity. Um, and I would love to see, you know, um, at Pride, at the Prides that we have, we're kind of waiting for Pride and what's happening in Pride in London this year because it's been lots of fallout. But you know, rather than Nando's Chicken, we want to see like proper community groups like walking there and like shaking a bucket and earning money, getting the money to actually fund these safe spaces for our trans brothers and sisters, but you know, for everybody in the queer community as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Faria. And there is so much more I would love to ask, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, it has been such a blessing. It's been so beautiful to be here with you all. 
And um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today, to our audiences, to Sumeya, our BSL interpreter, and to our incredible speakers, Fatma Askar, Zain Jukadar, Faryal Velmi, and Blair Imani. Thank you all for joining us and more power to all of you, to all of our speakers in the incredible work that you do. And um, so that's it from us at MFES for today. Please do join us tomorrow for an event on women's leadership in West African scholarship at 6 p.m. UK time. Um, salams from us and take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye.